Hey everybody, welcome to St. Stephen's Online. We hope you enjoy catching up on our talk from Sunday. Good morning everybody. Uh, for those of you who haven't met, my name's Matt and occasionally Libby releases me to preach. Um, and it's great, it's a great privilege to do so and to be here with you this morning. Let's pray, shall we, as we begin. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and nourish us with the Word of God. Come, Holy Spirit, and inspire and teach and challenge and reassure us. Come, Holy Spirit, and affirm the love of the Father in us. Come, Holy Spirit, and make Jesus, our Lord and Savior, real to us. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. As Libby said, the Acts of the Apostles is a very exciting book. Um, it's very, very real, and it's partly it's real um, because it's written by Luke, who also wrote Luke's Gospel, and Luke was a historian, and so there is lots of historical information in the Acts of the Apostles. He doesn't hide stuff. Um, there's just, it's just very real, and it's real because it's a real story. It actually happened. This is the beginning, Acts 2 is the beginning of the church of Jesus Christ, a church that continues today around the world, a church of which we here are a part today. And right at the beginning of Acts, Jesus says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And Acts is all about these words coming to reality in all the mess of the early church and in God's empowering spirit moving through them and working in them. Our title for this morning, uh, the one I've chosen anyway, is Overflowing. So if you've got a Bible with you, then uh, do keep it open on, if it's the church, one of the church ones, it's page 1093, or if you've got your app, open it to Acts 2, um, because I'm going to be uh, using some of the verses around it. So we're going to be thinking about the overflowing Holy Spirit, the way that the Spirit is described as overflowing to us, the way Acts 2 talks about the Spirit overflowing in us, and the way that it speaks about Uh, the Holy Spirit overflowing through us into the world. So overflowing to us, in us, and through us. Let's begin with overflowing to us. Verses 1 and 2 of Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, Pentecost is just 50 days after Passover. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were together in one place, all together in one place, and suddenly... A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Extraordinary. I wonder what that felt like for them. A couple of weeks ago, I was in God's own county of Yorkshire, where God is especially present. I was in Wensleydale um, uh, and Aysgarth Falls, Uh, And I took a video, which we're going to see in a second, um, and this video, when I was reading about this blowing of a violent wind, this thinking about this overflowing, that overflowing outpouring of the Spirit, this little 10-second video came to mind, which um, just as an illustration of what that might have been like, let's just watch this, literally 10 seconds. The roar and the power of that. I wonder if that's what it was like for those early disciples in that upper room. This is a generous overflowing of God's presence. This is not a little bit of a breeze or a small measured taster. This is the blowing of a violent wind is how Luke describes it. It's powerful. It's untamable. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. And it comes from heaven. This outpouring, this overflowing comes direct from God. It's really important to note, I think, that the Holy Spirit comes from outside of them. 
This isn't something that wells up from within them in this case. The Holy Spirit comes from outside. It's not something that the the disciples generate. This is from outside them. And this, I think, is really counter-cultural to us. Our culture often assumes that all the problems of the world are from the outside of us. It's always someone else's fault. Someone else is always to blame. Our parents or our boss or our circumstances or our friends or our kids or that bloke across the street who always parks in the wrong place it really winds me up. Um, there's, it always comes from outside. It's always someone else's fault. And our culture often says that the power to fix things comes from inside us. We self-actualize, we self-help, we self-start. The problems are outside, the fix is within us. The Bible is exactly the opposite way around. The Bible teaches us that the root problem of all our sin is in the human heart. Our rebellion against God. It comes from within. All have fallen short of the glory of God, writes Paul. And the gospel tells us that the solution comes from outside, from God. Our forgiveness and renewal in Jesus Christ, we cannot help ourselves, we cannot forgive ourselves. God does it for us and in us. The Holy Spirit empowers the church to live and be witnesses to Christ in the world, and that comes from outside of us, from the overflowing grace and the generosity of God. And in a middle-class church within which there are many professionals, all of whom are incredibly capable and gifted, we sometimes forget that and try and do things in our own strength. We can cope, we can manage, we can make this happen, we can do this. That's not how it happens in Acts. In Acts, yes, God uses the gifts gifts that he's given people, but the, the power comes from outside of them. And we as a church and as individuals need that power from outside of us. God overflowing to each of us. And notice that the Holy Spirit overflows on everyone in this room. It's not just the 12 apostles in here. They see tongues of flame which settle on them and each of them get a little flame. Luke is really clear that every man, woman and child in that room, every believer gets a dose of the Holy Spirit, not just the 12. Same for us today. The Holy Spirit is not just for the holy ones, for the ordained ones, for the leaders. The Holy Spirit is poured on all of us, on the whole church, on every believer. Everyone gets to play. Everyone gets to receive each day. And sometimes that happens in miraculous ways. I wonder um, what your experience has been of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've had one of those really dramatic experiences that we sometimes hear of. Uh, Maybe you've just sometimes had that deep sense of peace within you. Maybe you've just known sometimes that God is at work. Maybe you've had none of that. For the past um, couple of weeks, uh, those of you who know me will know, because I talk about it a lot, that I've been suffering with a bad back. I did a little disky thing a couple of weeks back. Not good. Um, and uh, partly through osteopath, wonderful osteopath, she's brilliant, but partly also through prayer, I would say that I'm not quite back yet, but I'm pretty much um, healed of it. And I've been prayed for three times, once here and once uh, a couple of times by other friends. And on one of those occasions, I would say I felt something of God's work in me, the Holy Spirit working in me. But the other two times I've had to trust that, that has happened. But it's definitely helped. Definitely helped. Some of us may have had, I've had a couple of occasions where I've had quite a dramatic experience of the Spirit through my life. But often that's not the case. That might, so today I wonder if it's an opportunity for us. I don't know what it is maybe in you at the moment. That maybe you need something from outside to help you to function well, to live life fully, to know the presence of God. Maybe today is an opportunity for you, for you to ask for that, to receive that, to just say, come Holy Spirit. Every day is that opportunity. The Holy Spirit is poured out to us 
to each of us, overflows to each of us. What does the Holy Spirit do? What does Luke tell us happened to those first followers of Jesus? Moving on to overflowing in us. We see three things, I think, that is in the Spirit of God overflowing in them. The tongues of fire that I've just mentioned in verse 3. We see in verse 11 that the people hear them declaring the wonders of God. And then in verse 13, they seem to be drunk, or at least some people say they are. They've had too much wine. So let's look at those three things. Verse 3, the tongues of fire on each of them. Throughout the Bible, we see God appear in fire. Think about Moses and the burning bush, or in that same kind of Exodus story, the pillar of flame. Those things are about God's presence with the people of God, or God's presence with Moses. In Acts, we see the very presence of God on each of the believers, which is extraordinary when you think about it. The very presence of God. Verse 4 tells us that each of them are filled with the Holy Spirit. And then what happens next? They declare the wonders of God. They're filled with an inner wonder that leads them to worship. This is more than them declaring truths that they kind of know in their heads, that they've maybe heard Jesus speak about, or they've heard others tell them Jesus has spoken about. This is more than head knowledge. This is something where the Spirit has enabled that knowledge to go from their heads to their hearts. They know it, not just know it. For example, there are lots of examples of this in the New Testament, but at Jesus' baptism, the Spirit descends on him like a dove, and, with, and the Father from heaven, the voice is heard that says, this is my Son. When we become Christians, Romans 8 and Galatians 4 um, tells us that the Holy Spirit affirms in us that we are children of God. If we've given our lives to Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that we're children of God. The kind of, it's a kind of matter of fact of faith. We are children of God. But do we know it? Imagine um, well, following a child and their parent down a road. Uh, the child and the parent are related to each other. One is the child, one is the parent. That's just a fact. They just are. They both know that in their heads. They both know that. But if the parent picks the child up and hugs them and holds them, the child experiences that relationship. The Holy Spirit does the same with us, enables us to experience that childness that we have with God, that we are children of God. The Acts 2 believers speak of the wonders of God because they know the wonders of God in their hearts, because the Spirit has made them real to them. If you're here this morning and you know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior and you want to experience more of that, just ask, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit and help my head knowledge to become more my heart knowledge, to make you real to me. Perhaps for you, your faith has always been just a head knowledge. You've been faithful in what you believe, but you don't like really know it, you wouldn't say. Just ask, come Holy Spirit, and God will make himself real to you. Perhaps you're here because you're exploring faith. I encourage you to ask Jesus to make himself known to you. Just pray those words, come Holy Spirit, make Jesus real to me. In Acts 2, the impact of this experience, this outpouring, this overflowing, is that they speak loudly of the wonders of God. And some assume that they've drunk too much, too much wine. Why do they think they assume that? I don't think these guys are slurring their words, or being obnoxious and leery, or uh, losing control of their limbs. I think this is about... A joyful fearlessness. The disciples are showing a joyful exuberance. They are speaking the wonders of God loudly, fearless in their declarations. When they got up on the morning of Pentecost, they are a fearful bunch. They have been told to wait in a room by Jesus and to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit, but they're in a room, they're locked up, they're inside a building in a house. 
They're fearful. They're hiding. And then you get this overflow, this outpouring. The Spirit comes on them and in them. And they're loud and they're speaking of the wonders of God, fearlessly, joyfully proclaiming the wonders of God. Peter's sermon that follows that King read a little bit of to us um, takes a lot of guts to stand up when uh, the leader has been killed a few weeks before. It takes a lot of guts for him to stand up and speak, or a lot of the Holy Spirit emboldening him. The Spirit-filled Christian has the very presence of God overflowing in them and experiences that presence, that love of God. He's given gifts through healing and restoration, and we sung about some of that this morning, Um, and all sorts of other blessings, which is great, but those are not only to make us feel good and to make us as individuals whole. Those are there for us to share. They flow from us too. The Spirit overflows to us, overflows in us, and, and overflows through us in joyful fearlessness. Which moves us on to that overflowing through us. Have you ever wondered why Luke bothers to list all those names of the uh, languages and nations in verses 9 to 11? It's not just to cause panic amongst the poor soul that's asked to read them. Luke lists those for a purpose. He is a historian. There is a reason he's put these in. Why does he do that? I think it's to emphasize one of the great and one of the unique things about Christianity, one of the unique truths about Christianity. The good news of Jesus is for every nation and every language. This might appear shocking to some of you, but God is not English or indeed Welsh, and doesn't speak solely in English or Welsh. No single language or culture or nation owns Christianity. It is for all people. The reason Luke lists all these nations is that it belongs to everyone. It's for everyone. Christianity is truly multicultural and multilingual and for all people. And as I'm standing here, I can see that. The tongues spoken of in, Acts 2, in this Acts 2 passage are not the spiritual gift of tongues uh, that uh, Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians uh, that need interpreting because no one can understand what's being said. That's not what's happening here. What's happening here is that everyone is hearing the wonders of God in their own language. The miracle of verses 9 to 11 is everyone hears the Christians speaking in their own language. Each person hears the wonders of God in their heart language. I work at the moment um, with a wonderful guy called Jens, who's a Christian pastor who happens to be German. Uh, His daughter, Ellie, also works in the same office as we do. And I've noticed that when the two of them speak to each other, not about work, They speak in German. They just slip straight into German. It's their heart language. I'm not multilingual, but I'm I'm told that if you are, the way you know what your heart language is is when you get really annoyed with someone you love, you slip into it. Is that correct? Or when you're... (laughs) There's a nod coming from over there. Or when you're trying to express something that's really deeply personal to you, to someone you love, you slip back into uh, into your heart language. God speaks to each of us in our heart language. God speaks in the heart language because God wants to connect with each of our hearts and our lives. And God wants us to be a multicultural, multilingual family. We all belong. And the Spirit was poured out on all of us. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will come and empower his disciples to be witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, even unto Twickenham, even unto your office, even unto your school, to your social gathering, to anywhere else you happen to go. Each of us who are filled with the Holy Spirit and receive all that through that overflowing in and through in us, is, uh, the Spirit overflows through us as witnesses. If you're anything like me, then you probably would far rather be locked in a room somewhere where you don't really have to speak about your faith to the people around you. 
the vast majority of us, I suspect, are in that camp. There are some of us who are gifted evangelists who can't understand why the rest of us can't just talk about it. But there are others of us who need that kind of nudge. All of us are called to witness in word and deed and to speak of our experience of faith and to trust God for the results. The Spirit is poured out on the church in Acts to make them unstoppable in their witness of Jesus Christ. And we see that unfolding as you read on in Acts. If you, like me, are um, not confident in sharing your faith or are nervous about it, then ask, come Holy Spirit, bring me the boldness and the opportunities to speak. God overflows to us in the abundance and power of the, ho- of the Holy Spirit, overflowing in us so we experience his great love and blessings for us, and so that we speak with joyful fearlessness, overflowing through us that we might be one multilingual, multicultural family, and that we might each be witnesses empowered by the Holy Spirit, and that the church might be a witness empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak and act as his name so that everyone gets to hear of the love of God. Thanks for listening. We hope you found that encouraging. Have a great week and see you soon.